Well, somebody say amen. Wonderful, wonderful music. Thank you so much. I, uh, uh, it, you, you don't understand unless you've played piano or some instrument how much work and how that goes into it and the practice and so on. And uh, anytime someone uh, does a special or they play the piano for an offertory or something, you ought to stop and think about the work that went into it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, that's a time <coughs> for you to communicate with God, too. I, I like offertories. I like specials because I, I, uh, I, I just want to connect with the Lord, you know, through that special or that song or whatever. I'd like to say a couple of things. First of all, how much I admire your pastor. Uh, I, I've, I've known him now for all these years, and uh, uh, straight as an arrow, solid as can be, and you need to thank God that you have a man of God like this. Uh, you, and again, uh, as a layman, you don't understand really all that the pastor carries, but it's a heavy load, it's not an easy one, and it's 24-7. It's not just, uh, uh, he works three hours a week and that's it, it doesn't work that way. The second thing I want to say is help him with that offering. Uh, sacrificially give for that offering. Um, my budget was $62,300 a week. And it was a heavy, heavy burden. And uh, we, uh, Abe, the last year I pastored, we were $200 a week over budget. So we just barely made it. People looked at all those buildings and all that and they thought we were uh, rich, but that's not true. Uh, what comes in goes out. And uh, so we, had, you, you better thank God he's your pastor, not me. Because I had two give-it-alls a year. I had one in the spring and one in the fall. Breathe in, breathe out. Uh, uh, I, I inherited a bond, bonding program that really put me under the gun when I first went there. And we had to have a sinking fund deposit every week because we had to pay out 20000 25000 uh, a quarter. And it was a, just a heavy, heavy burden. So I challenged the people one time. I said, let's pay off those bonds. And bless their hearts, they raised over $200,000. And we had a bond burning and burned those stupid bonds. And uh, that was a big relief. So uh, give, you, you cannot give the Lord. You cannot do it. So let me encourage you. Uh, and, and by the way, there'll be some wonderful stories you'll be able to testimony. You'll be able to give how God repaid you. And, and blessed you because you sacrificially give. Uh, don't, he, he's got to have your help. I know the burden. I know the heavy load. And uh, now that's as nice as I'm going to be to you. All right. Romans chapter 1, if you would. Romans chapter 1 and verse 9. Romans chapter 1 and verse 9, if you would. Romans chapter 1. I, I, I want you to understand tonight that without the power of the Holy Spirit, you cannot do what you need to do. You need the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and you also not only need the individual filling of the Holy Spirit of God, but you need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church corporately. And so there are two things at play in Acts chapter 2, for example. One is that you personally be filled with the Spirit of God. And I want to help you with that. Here's the, here's the phrase. Yielding is filling. Write that down. Yielding is filling. Yielding is filling. There are no vacuums. Whatever you allow in, of your spirit to give to the Holy Spirit, He automatically uh, controls that. Now, uh, the Bible says, write this down please, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, and I quote it this morning, quench not the spirit. So, quench not the spirit. So, the secret to Holy Spirit power is yielding. Yielding your spirit to the Holy Spirit. And when you yield your spirit to the Holy Spirit, you may be scared to death to witness. You may be scared about approaching, but there's something that overcomes you with the Holy Spirit. The Bible compares it to a, this sounds terrible, to a drunk man. Uh, under the influence of liquor, God says a man is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He gets beyond himself, and all of a sudden it's God flowing through him. And you're, you'll even be surprised at yourself. Uh, that what the Holy Spirit's doing through you. I want to talk to you tonight about this subject, about the key to the Holy Spirit is man's spirit. The key to the Holy Spirit is man's spirit. If this city is to be one to Christ, 
if we're to do what we're supposed to do, we've got to have the Holy Spirit of God. We've got to have a filling of the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I, I went, uh, I, when I went to, first went to Longview in 1980, we were renting a home, and uh, we didn't own one. And uh, my wife said, I think maybe we need to buy something if, if we're going to spend the rest of our life here. And I said, well, I, I think we should. And uh, I said, why don't you, I don't know what you want. Just here's the budget, whatever you can do within the budget, that's fine with me. And I went to Little Rock, Arkansas to preach and came back. When I came back, my wife had moved. Uh, <laughs> serious. I came back, went to our house, and there was a note on the door that said, we have moved. And uh, I, I lo looked at it, and it said, go to 2309 Kentucky Drive. That's where we are. And uh, so I drove over there, and sure enough, uh, that they, and I walked into the house. Everything we owned was, in, was piled in one room. My wife was so excited about getting this house, and, uh, and she talked this real estate man into letting her move in before we bought it. I, it's, it's, and I... I still don't know how she did it, but the real estate man let us let her move in. Uh, I had nothing to do with it, and uh, but they got a bunch of church people. They dumped all of our first, everything right in one area, and had mattresses laid out where the kids were sleeping and mom was sleeping. And uh, I said, "What in the world have you done?" And she said, "Well, I talked to this real estate man. I said, look, my, my daddy will buy this house. <laughs> my daddy's got money.'" And uh, I said, "We." You're talking about your daddy? Your daddy's dead. And she's, no, I was talking about you. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, here's, here's the illustration. Everything was in one room. We were in the house, but we didn't completely control the house. Listen carefully. The Holy Spirit was born in you. But there may be compartments or places in your life where the Holy Spirit is not dwelling. We were in the house, but we did not control the house. And you need the Holy Spirit of God to control your spirit. Amen. And yielding is filling. And I think you'll see it uh, in a minute. Let's, let's stand. Romans chapter 1 verse 9. Let's stand and stretch for a moment here if you would. Uh, I need the Spanish pastor to come up. I need the uh, piano player to come up. And uh, who else can I? Can I, uh, I? I need to borrow. Yeah, come on up here if you would. And uh, I need for the Spanish pastor to stand here. I need for the uh, piano player to stand in front of that chair, and then I need for you to stand in front of that chair right there, all right? Stand here and face that side. Face him like a man, buddy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I want to use illustration, and I want you to listen carefully. It will not be long tonight, but I think it could be life-changing. It could be life-changing. I took a church that had 400 people in it. We split. I went to pastor school in 81, came back, and they left me. <laughs> And I had 159 left in a 1,200-seat auditorium at that time. We've added a balcony since then. But, man, alive, I thought the world, I thought this was the end of the world for me. I left a church up north that loved me, and I loved them, and we built it from nothing to over 500 in attendance. And then it went south, and I was there just a few months, and uh, they flat left, got mad at me and left. I don't understand that because to know me is to love me. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but uh, I saw God do a miracle. I literally saw God do a miracle. We had an $8,000 budget with $2,250 coming in, but we still made it. It was a miracle, an absolute miracle. And the church began to grow, but it's because of this emphasis tonight. And I want you to please listen carefully. This will revolutionize your soul winning. This, this will, will, will cause miracles to happen when you start talking to people under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I was preaching one Sunday morning, preaching up a storm, and a woman stood up in the back and started screaming, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. I've got to get saved. And she ran down to the altar. She ruined my sermon. <laughs> and, uh, and she got saved, and revival broke out. I saw... One night when J. Harold Smith preached our, at God's Three Deadlines at our place, and he preached at 7 o'clock that night, the invitation was still going at 12.30 in the morning. We had 92 people saved and baptized that night. Uh, the police came to the church because they thought something happened to family members who didn't come back home. They went to church didn't come back. So they sent the police down to the church 
They were standing in the back corner while the invitation was going at 12.30 in the morning. And I sent the assistant pastor, Brother Bowen, back there. And I said, find out what those men want. And he told Brother Bowen. And then he said to Brother Bowen, what in the world's going on here? He said, sir, take a good look because this is what you call a revival. And that sergeant got saved that night. That policeman got saved. I've, I've seen it. I've, I've seen it. And, and I've, I've witnessed it. And I've seen it. And, but it's all because of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And so let's take a look at our verse here. You got it? Romans chapter 1, verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve. Now look at this prepositional phrase, with my spirit. That's a small s, not a capital S, meaning man's spirit. Serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I want to use that as a beginning. We're going to look at some scripture tonight, so you pay attention, please. And if I move too quickly, just jot the references down. I lived in Michigan for a while, so I, I may get it going a little fast. I was born in Arkansas, born slow, and then sped it up. And uh, <laughs> Father, thank you for the dear people tonight. Thank you for this pastor. Sacrificially, him and his family, they've paid a price. 25 years, it's amazing. And God, help me to put one more brick of truth in the wall of life tonight. Please help me. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Now, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Matthew 10, 28. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, the Scripture says, again, if I move too quickly, I apologize. Just jot the reference down. And Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Underline the word soul and the word body. In this scripture here, you have a picture of the person that's going to hell. The person that's going to hell has a body, has a soul, but there's no mention of a spirit here. His spirit is in darkness. That's why the Bible says a lost man has a veil over his eyes. He's in darkness. He's lost. He can't understand. Church was not meant for lost people. Listen carefully now. Bus ministries were not meant for lost people. Uh, church is meant for saved people. Now that's why he said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then that's why in Luke 14 he said bring them in. So our job is to win them to Christ get them to church, get them baptized like you've said, what a wonderful day this has been today. And, but the person going to hell, according to the Scripture here, has a body and soul, but his spirit is dead. All right? Here's a body. Here's a soul. Sit down. Here's, oops, sorry. There's the sp spirit. Now, this man is headed for hell because the Bible says he has a body, has a soul, but his spirit is dead. Now, in this uh, spirit here, in fact, turn to Ephesians chapter 2 with me, please. Ephesians chapter 2, and take a look at verses 1 and 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2, the Scripture says, and uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you hath he quickened. Now that word quickened means brought to life. Dead, but brought to life. Quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where did time passed, ye walked according to the course of this world according to the prince and the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience so the bible says clearly here that the person that's going to hell is uh, is 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 dead in god's sight he has a body has a soul but his spirit is dead but the bible also says that there's a spirit of disobedience in him i need a little devil is there a little devil here oh <laughs> come on come on up here i need a little devil here there you go. Come on up here. All right. Stand right there. All right. Now, according to the Scripture now, the, the person, uh, John 8, 44, you, you're the father of the devil. Uh, that means that a person that's going to hell has a body and soul, and he has a little devil in him. Stand up here if you would. A little devil and face them. Turn around and face them. He has a, a, a spirit of disobedience in him. All right. Now, a soul winner comes by. Do you want to be a soul winner? Come on up here. You be a soul winner. Bring your Bible. Don't, always bring your Bible, son. Uh, okay. Come on up here. Oh, it's an NIV. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. Now, according to Matthew 10, 28, 
The person that's going to hell has a body, don't miss this now, has a soul, but his spirit is dead. But Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says he does have a spirit in him, the spirit of disobedience. Okay, now a soul winner comes by, open the Bible up, a soul winner comes by and asks, do you want to be saved? And he says, yes, I'd like to be saved. That's what he says. Yes, I would. And this is confrontational soul winning. And so now the Holy Spirit comes in, and here's what he does according to the Word of God. He binds this devil and kicks this devil out. Oh, man, stand, stand up. Be a man. Face it like a man. Put your arms behind you. All right? Stand right there. Now, then the Holy Spirit then quickens or brings to life the spirit of a man. You got that? All right. Take your Bibles, if you will, and uh, let's, let's uh, oh, where should we go? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, let's go there, 1 Thessalonians. And let's go to uh, chapter 5, and uh, let's take a look at verse, at verse uh, 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Again, if I move too quickly, please just jot the reverence down. Here's what it says. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now, that's W-H-O-L-L-Y. That's not H-O-L-Y. That's like the whole pie. Why did I say that? Uh, I'm hungry. Uh, and uh, how many went to Kentucky Fried Chicken today? No, never mind. Uh, God of peace, sanctify you wholly, and pray that your whole, W-H-O-L-E, watch it, spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's the difference between that and Matthew 10, 28? The difference is the spirit is alive. Why is it alive? Because a soul winner came by, presented the Word of God. That's the seed right there, the Word of God, and uh, accepted Jesus. And so when he did, very good. Then uh, sit down. You're dead. Uh, come back up here. All right, here's the devil. And so the Holy Spirit comes around and binds this devil and kicks this devil out and then brings to life the spirit of a man. Now, so now he's a whole person. Are, we, are you with me tonight? Okay, he's a whole person. Why is he a whole person? Because he has a body, has a soul, and his spirit is quickened and alive. So when you go soul winning, the object is to get the seed there, the Word of God, and let them know what that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay, what part gets saved? The soul of it. The body doesn't get saved. It's the soul that gets saved. You never hear a preacher say we had five bodies saved today. It's always five souls that get saved. So the difference between Matthew 10, 28 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 is the fact that the Spirit is alive. Now, write this down, please. 1 John 4, 4. I mentioned it this morning. 1 John 4, 4. Now, 1 John 4, 4 says this. Uh, uh, when, when you think about salvation, you've got to think about the person of the, of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You have to think in those terms. So greater is he, on purpose, God put the word he in there, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So I'm going to play the part of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and is born in the spirit of a man. And this devil tries to come back. Keep your arms behind you now. Keep, come, try to come back. And so he, he can't because the Holy Spirit, greater is he, the Holy Spirit, than he, the devil. Got it? So that's how you stay saved. You don't stay saved because of, of anything you do. You stay saved because of the Holy Spirit of God. He keeps you saved. Well, somebody shout amen. amen. So you see the difference. Matthew 10, 28. The man going to hell has a body, soul. All right, come on, devil, back up here. Spirit, sit down. And but... He's, he's got a body and soul, but his spirit's dead. It's, it's dead. Now, Ephesians uh, 2, 1 and 2 says that he, you're quickened, you're quickened, brought to life. What part's brought to life? The spirit of the man. So he, he brings the word of God. He says, yes, I want to be saved. The Holy Spirit comes in and binds this little devil and kicks this devil out and then brings to life the spirit of a man. All right. Now, turn to John chapter 3 with me, please. John chapter 3. Again, if I move too quickly, please I am. Uh, please forgive me. But turn to John chapter 3. I need to quit apologizing, don't I? John chapter 3. John chapter 3. <laughs> I hear others do it, and I say, don't, don't apologize. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm building a kingdom. All right. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, now watch this carefully now. Verse 24, I'm sorry. John chapter th uh, 4. And verse 23, 
But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, so you, would you agree with they're false worshipers? Yeah, oh, okay. True worshipers shall worship the Father in what? Spirit, I can't hear you. In what? Capital S or small s? Holy Spirit or man spirit? Man spirit. True worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, which comes first, the spirit or the truth? Spirit does. All right, go back to John chapter 3 with me, please. John chapter 3, that famous first seven verses there about the new birth. And in verse, uh, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily I say, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, the word spirit, there's a capital S speaking of the Holy Spirit. The water birth is speaking of the human being's flesh. Uh, only humans can get saved. Now, for the next verse, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, referring to the water birth, and that which is born of the Spirit, capital S, is Spirit, small s. Now, don't leave me now. I'm heading somewhere. So, the man going to hell, Matthew 10, 28, has a body, has a soul, but his spirit, sit down, his spirit is dead, and there's a spirit of disobedience in him, a little devil. The Holy Spirit comes along through the Word of God. And you have to make up your mind if you want to get saved or not. Nobody's going to make you get saved. So he says, yes, I want to be saved. So it's based on the seed, and the seed is planted. So the Holy Spirit comes in and binds that little devil and kicks that devil out and brings to life the spirit of a man. Now, where is the Holy Spirit born? The Holy Spirit is born in the spirit of this man. All right? Now, take a pen and draw a circle about the size of a half dollar. Do I have half dollars anymore? I don't even know if they do or not. Put your hands behind your back. You do exactly what I tell you to do. You understand? Okay. Uh, greater is he than he is in the world. But, uh, oh, that was funny. That was funny. Uh, now, draw a circle about the size of a half dollar. Let that represent the body. Inside of that, draw a smaller circle. Let that represent the soul. Draw a real small circle on the inside. Let that represent the spirit of a man. Okay, you got it? Got a big circle, that's the body. Smaller circle, that's the soul. The little bitty circle is the spirit. Now darken that little bitty circle. Darken it. That's a lost man. That's a man headed for hell. He's in darkness. He's blind. He can't see. Come on back, devil. Sit down. You're dead. And so the devil is, is in the man that's going to hell. He has a body and soul, but his spirit's dead. But he does have, Ephesians chapter 2 says, a spirit of disobedience. Okay, you got it? So, so when it comes by, it gives him the word. He says, yes, I want to be saved. Holy Spirit comes in and binds this little devil, kicks the devil out, and brings to life the spirit of man. Now, hold it now. The Holy Spirit's born in the spirit. Now, draw below that another half dollar size, a, a half dollar size. Let that represent the body. Then draw a smart, son, turn around and stand. You've got to stand there and obey me. Uh, now, so draw another circle. All right, let that represent the body. Draw a smaller circle on the inside. This is a different circle now, all right? And then a little bitty circle on the inside, but don't darken that one. That's where the Holy Spirit's born. The Holy Spirit's born in the spirit of a man. The spirit of a man communicates with God. The soul communicates with other human beings. That's Brother Howell's that famous sermon, You Got Soul, Baby. Uh, it's a great sermon. But, uh, you know, men talk about hunting and fishing and, and so on. Women talk about other women. And... Uh, <laughs> So here, the soul communicates with others. Now, the body communicates with Pizza Hut and Burger King and, and the sense world. Okay, you got that? All right, now, but don't miss this now. The Holy Spirit, grab my arm now. The Holy Spirit, it, well, two hands, try two hands. Okay, good. Now, we're not dating, but uh, just, okay. So the Holy Spirit now is born in the spirit of a man. Now, the Bible says, quench not the spirit. So what part of you quenches the work of the Holy Spirit? Your spirit. What's your spirit like tonight? Is there anybody who can walk in here and sit down next to you and ruin your night? Then your spirit's not right. Is there anything in your life you're mad about, ticked off about with God? Well, you can't have the power of the Holy Spirit then. So he, he released the spirit. Let me go. Then I overpower the soul. Now I talk about the things of God. You got it? Then if, if the soul releases me and I take over the body, then I go to church. I quit my smoking, cussing, dipping, chewing, and running around. And all of a sudden, I'm physically where I should be because I'm under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I quit church, I push me back to the soul. And I may talk about God, but I ain't going to show up to church. 
And then after a while, you'll push it back to where you won't even talk about God, and only you and God know that you're saved. You got it? Okay, let's back up and see what we learn. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, the man going to hell has a, you tell me now, he has a what? A body and a what? Soul. What about a spirit? His spirit is what? Dead. Spirit's dead. Sit down. You're dead. And the devil is ruling and reigning. <laughs> now, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, uh, quickened. Now, what part of a man is quickened? Well, of course, the spirit. The spirit. That's what John 3, 5, 6, and 7 is saying. That's what John chapter 4 is talking about. So a soul winner comes by. He says, yes, I want to be saved. The Holy Spirit comes in, binds that devil, kicks the devil out, and brings to life the spirit of man. Now, the spirit of man, if you will release the Holy Spirit, he'll influence your soul, and you'll talk about the things of God. It's on your mind. You can't help it. And then after a while, it'll control your body. And guess what? You'll come back for Monday night and Tuesday night. And uh, you're under the influence now of it. So you, you go soul winning. You do things you normally would not do, but it's under the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now turn to John. Go back to John chapter 4, if you would. John chapter 4. Now, he says here, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So the spirit comes before the truth, small s, man's spirit. What's your spirit like? You got a good spirit? I don't care what happens in your life, you ought to have a good spirit. You know the people that have the real problem, the folks going to hell. The people that are going to burn in hell, they have the real problem. You don't have a real, I know you got a mother-in-law, but you don't have a real problem. <laughs> the guy was at the funeral of his mother-in-law. He was sitting there next to his wife, and uh, his wife started crying. My mother's dead and crying, and the husband started crying. And the wife looked over and said, you did love mother too, didn't you? He said, no, I thought I saw her move. But anyway, <laughs> but don't misunderstand, I love my wife's mother-in-law. <laughs> Your brain's frozen uh, in spirit and in truth. Now watch this carefully. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Who's he looking for? The person that his spirit is right with God. The sins in the average fundamental Baptist church are not smoking and cussing and dipping and dope and adultery and porn. No, no, no. The sins that dominate churches are sins of the Spirit. That you get your feelings hurt. You get upset about something. You sang a special and nobody bragged on it. I'll tell you why. Because it was horrible. <laughs> now, the Bible says that Jesus is walking through a church, and let me tell you what he's looking for. He's looking for somebody that's got a good spirit. Now, what will he give you if you have a good spirit? Truth. That's why Dr. Hiles, uh, Dr. Hiles did not go out to eat. Dr. Hiles, when he got through preaching a sermon, and I, and I asked him one time, he said, I heard Vance Havner say that many a sermon is ruined by fellowship. And I've never forgotten that. And people would criticize Brother Hiles because he'd preach and go back to the room. But the truth is, he wanted the Holy Spirit of God to work. That's what he wanted. And if you ever heard him preach, you would say to yourself, where in the world? I've read that verse a thousand times. How did he get that out of there? I was in Cheyenne, Wyoming, preaching with him. We were in a van going back Tuesday morning, going back to the motel, and he just knocked it out of the ballpark that morning. And it was fabulous. And we're in the van, and I said, Brother Hiles, where'd you get that? He said, out of the Bible. Y'all try reading it. <laughs> Sarcastic. Uh, now, please understand. Let's go back up. Matthew 10, 28. The man's going to hell has a what? Talk to me. Has a what? Body. Has a what? Soul. Is the spirit dead? Yeah, no mention of it at all. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, you're quickened. What part of you is quickened? The spirit of a man. All right, where is the Holy Spirit born? The Holy Spirit is born in the spirit of a man. Now, if you have the right spirit, then you can release the Holy Spirit, and it'll influence your soul. And you who are afraid to go soul winning, you'll find yourself talking to people, scared to death, but you, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is oozing out of you. You just you can't help it. It's just, it's, just, it's just there. And then after a while, it began to control the body. And next thing you know, you're going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and special meetings and everything else. And you're giving tithes and offerings, and you're helping with a big offering. All of a sudden, you find yourself doing something you never dreamed that you would ever do. But it's under the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you. Y'all can be seated. Give them a hand. Don't, you, uh, you sit right there, Pastor. Yeah, right there. And the 
piano player, said it right there. Okay, I'm going to use you two again. And uh, so, uh, here's the important thing. You can't do a thing without the Holy Spirit of God. And it all starts with your spirit. Keep your spirit right. Well, that preacher did everything but call my name. We'll come back next Sunday night and we'll call your name. Man, I, wanna, I want my doctor to be honest with me. I've been in the uh, doctor's office. My wife had a tumor on her right lung the size of a fist. And six months later, she had the same thing on her left lung. I don't want the doctor to say, I'm, I'm not going to point anybody out here, but somebody in this room has a tumor on their right lung, size of the fist. But I'm not going to point anybody out. No, be honest with me. We want our doctors to be honest with us. We want our lawyers to be honest. We want everything in our life uh, to be, be honest with us. I want to hear the truth. But when it comes to preaching, we get mad about it. I had a guy I led to Christ. He was a state powerlift champion in Texas. And he was a big old uh, fella. And uh, I, he, he uh, got saved, led him to Christ, his whole family, his mom and dad to Christ, and brothers, everybody to Christ. And uh, they had master's degrees and were very intelligent people. And so he, he, we're out sowing one day, and he looked at me and he said, listen, if you see anything in my life that will hinder me from winning souls and serving God, you tell me. You tell me. Three weeks later, I said, you need to get a haircut, man. Never saw him again. Never saw him again. Don't open your big fat mouth and say, tell me the truth, and I'll take it and then walk away. Come on, somebody say amen now. The issue tonight is if you're saved, thank God you're saved, but don't quench the Holy Spirit of God by having a bad spirit. Don't do it. If you've got aught against any brother in Christ, you confess it like drinking liquor, like pornography. You, you, you confess it tonight and say, dear God, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive I didn't. You, some of you, are. if you're not careful, you'll have some hatred in your heart. And it, there'll be no power. You'll not see anything God do. It. And you, you may look great. You may come here, smile and sing and everything else. And, but yet have it in your heart. Nobody know about but you and God. But people will die and go to hell because of it. We've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got to have it in our music. We've got to have it in our preaching. We've got to have it in our Sunday school class. We've got to have it in every area of our church service. We've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You can't afford to carry a grudge. You can't afford to have a chip on your shoulder. Well, I walked down the hallway and she didn't say anything to me. Well, maybe she didn't see you. Why, why does it have to be something wrong all the time? You know, your biggest enemy is your mind. It runs wild. And when it starts running wild, and, 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 and no truth to it at all, but you've got this thing playing in your mind. Next thing you know, you're offended. Next thing you know, you're hurt. Next thing you know, you don't come back to church. Don't do that. There are always going to be things that hurt you and things that prick you and things like that. But let, take it to God and say, God, forgive me for having that feeling in my heart. Amen. If you want to see people saved. If you want to see people's lives changed, we've got to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Now, take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9. In 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9, you know the story. Here's Elijah, the man of God, and Elisha, one of the preacher boys, and he had, Elijah had the school of the prophets. It was a Bible college. He had a bunch of preacher boys. And he's getting ready to cross the river. And the preacher boys, didn't, they didn't want to follow the man of God. But Elisha said, you're not getting out of my sight. <laughs> Elisha said, I don't care where you go, man of God, I'm going with you. <laughs> Whether you want me or not, I'm going with you. Best thing you can do is stick next to your man of God. Amen. Best thing in the world you can do is stay with him. Don't, don't stay on the other side of the river. All right? Now let's see what happens here. And sometimes we read Scripture too quickly. Well, I'll slow down a little bit. Now look at verse 9. And it came to pass when they, I'm talking about Elijah and Elisha, the preacher boy, were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, the preacher boy, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Now carefully look at this. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit Spirit, small s, be upon me. Sometimes I preach and young preachers will come up and say, would you lay hands on me and pray I get a double portion of the Holy Spirit? I say, I can't. There's only one Holy Spirit. You can't. No, no. You got all of him. But does he have all of you is the question. 
Now, he said here, Elijah, here's what Elijah said. Elijah, I love your spirit. I love your spirit. Before you go to heaven, would you please give me a double portion, not of the Holy Spirit, but of your spirit. Now, why? I'll show you why. Come on up here. Hurry, the Lord's coming. <laughs> Stand shoulder to shoulder and face him. Face him like a man. All right, there you go. I'm going to let this represent the spirit of the man. I'm going to represent the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit is trying to get through your spirit to get the work done. So here's what he's trying to do. But you're quenching him, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. You're quenching him. So the Holy Spirit, or verse 19, the Holy Spirit is trying to get through to do the work. Now, your spirit is keeping the power of the Holy Spirit from doing his work. Now, you, if you open up just a little bit, that's as much room as the Holy Spirit has. You got it? If you open up a little bit more, then the Holy Spirit's got more room to go through. I'm talking about this is your spirit. If you open up all the way, now you've got a Jack Hiles or Lee Robertson or uh, Billy Sunday on your hands. But here's what happens. You let something get to you and slowly come back. The truth is slowly, slowly come back. And the next thing you know, you don't even realize it, but you're pushing the Holy Spirit back to where the Holy Spirit can't do His work. Because it has to be through your spirit, according to the Bible. So God said, true worshipers are those that, are, that come to me and their spirit is right and I can give them truth because I can trust them. Some of you can't be trusted with truth because you hurt somebody with it. But here, so you open up. Now, as much room as you, okay, let's, let's say it this way. A, a two-inch pipe restricts the flow of the fluid, right? Okay. Uh, a one-inch pipe restricts the flow of the fluid, right? Okay, some of your spirits tonight are the size of a juice cup at the Lord's Supper table. <laughs> Fill me, Lord. Okay, thank you. You ought to trade it in for a cup size. You ought to trade your spirit in for a pitcher size or a rain barrel size. R really, honestly, some of you just ought to get a joke book. You know, you know <laughs> some of you haven't smiled since I've been here. And if you did, you'd crack your face and bleed to death. Look, start smiling before you die. If you're a single girl, smile or you'll never get married. But anyway, uh, please understand what God is saying here. God is saying that my Holy Spirit that created the world, my Holy Spirit that put everything just exactly in order like it should be, that created your body, the Holy Spirit, the greatness of the Holy Spirit is being quenched by your spirit. Open up your spirit and let the Holy Spirit flow through you. Now, all you men stand up. All you men stand up. All you men stand up. All you can do is look down if you've got pants on. <laughs> stand up. All right? Now, on the count of three, say amen real loud. Are you ready? One, two, three. Amen. Thank you. Now, sit down and keep it up. Now, listen to me. Saying amen doesn't make you spiritual, but it'll dead sure keep you awake. All you women stand up now. All you women stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. On the count of three, say, uh-huh. Are you ready? One, two, three. Uh -huh. Woo! Sit down and keep that up, girl. Now, the truth is, you can help the preacher. We're working together. We're, this is a team effort. The devil's the enemy. Not, not you and not me. So the, the preacher preaches truth, and he preaches it, pitches it out at you. You men say amen back to him. Because there are people sitting on the pew where you are. The Holy Spirit does not live in his building. He lives in your body. And if you sit there like a sourpuss and mad about something, then somebody's going to die and go to hell. Because it has to be the Holy Spirit that convicts. If there's no conviction, there's no, come on, no conviction, no conversion. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't want my worst enemy to go to hell. We've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit is born in your spirit. That's where he's born. But your spirit has got to release him to where it affects your soul, to where you can talk about the things of God under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And then your body, you who are trying to quit smoking, you're trying to quit the, the acts of the body and so on like that. Well, good grief. If under the power of the Holy Spirit, that'll happen. My daddy smoked for years. In fact, he died from emphysema and Hodgkin's uh, disease. But because of his, his lungs were terrible. It was like black, uh, what, what do they call it? Uh, yeah, tar, but uh, black lung. That's what they called it. Well, that's what he had. 
And uh, my, my, my dad, bless his heart, he just, he, he just absolutely ruined his life. But then one day, he just up and quit. And I asked him, I said, Daddy, what was it? He said, I took it to God. I took it to the Holy Spirit. I said, I can't do this. I can't, I can't do this. I'm addicted. And I admit it. And I can't do a thing about it. And he said, the Holy Spirit helped me to quit. Now, he said, if somebody ever tells you they never have, are not tempted to smoke again, they're lying. Mary, you tell me. He said, oh, no. He said, if I get around, so I'll never forget. I led an elderly man to Christ, great Christian, led much of his family members to Christ. And, uh, and one Sunday night, he brought down a box of cigars and put it on the altar. And uh, after the service, one of the uh, janitors came and said, this was left at the altar. I said, what is it? He said, it's a box of cigars. I said, who, who did that? He told me who did it. And so the next Thursday, I'm going soul winning with him. And uh, he, he said, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, nothing in my life is hard giving up those cigars. And he said, it killed me to, to give them to you. And he said, you better not smoke them either. And uh, uh, so we, we knocked on the door, the first door, and guess what happened? A guy came to the door with a cigar in his mouth. And this guy just went blowing smoke like this. And I looked at my young, my old convert, but I looked at him, and he, he was just, stand, just staring uh, like that. So we gave the gospel to him. We got in the car, and my, my, uh, he didn't say a word. We're driving down the road. I said, what are you thinking? He said, here's what I'm thinking. If I get to heaven and find out it's all right to smoke cigars, I'm going to punch you right in a glorified smell. <laughs> <laughs> now, tonight, the guy that's going to hell, Matthew 10, 28, says he's a body and soul, but his spirit's dead. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says that spirit can be quickened by the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit's born in the spirit of the man and quench not the spirit. If you release the spirit, you'll get truth. And next thing you know, you, your soul, you'll be, talk, you'll be talking bravely about the Lord where you normally wouldn't do it. And then you'll start doing things with your body in service to God that you never would have thought that you, that you would ever do. All right? Thank you. You may be seated. Give them another hand. They did a good job, didn't they? All right? Now turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Is this making sense to you? All right, good. Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul, to me, outside of our Lord, was the greatest soul winner, I think, in the Bible, outside of our Lord Jesus. Now, in Acts 17, 16, it gives us a little hint about the Apostle Paul. I want you to see it, please. Acts 17, 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. Doesn't say the Holy Spirit. Doesn't say that at all. Small s. It was his spirit that was stirred in him when he saw the city holy given to idolatry. And guess what happened? His spirit was stirred. Now, understand, the Holy Spirit is sitting on the throne of your soul. And the Holy Spirit is sitting there, and the, the things you're excited about, he's not excited about. The NBA finals mean nothing to him. They mean nothing to him. The Broncos mean nothing to God. The cowboys mean everything to God. <laughs> but there are things that, that you, you give interest to that doesn't excite the Holy Spirit. Now, but one day you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go soul winning. And the Holy Spirit says, what would you say? You're going to do what? And the Holy Spirit gets up and says, let's get with it. Let's go. Or maybe you say, you know what I'm going to do? I think I'm going to visit a bus route on Saturday. And the Holy Spirit says, what was that? What, what, what did you say? You're going to do what? You're going to go soul winning and visit a bus route? Wow, I think I'll help you. The Holy Spirit is there. But you need to stir up your spirit so the Holy Spirit gets stirred up. Amen. Be a cheerleader for Jesus. Amen. Be a cheerleader for soul winning. Be a cheerleader for the bus ministry. Be a cheerleader for the things of God. Be a cheerleader and bring people on Resurrection Sunday. Be a cheerleader and say amen and be a cheerleader. And ladies, smile. And not, I know you left your teeth home, but gum it, baby, gum it. Uh, all right. Now, turn to Acts chapter 18 and verse 5. You'll see this. Oh, I don't have time to go through all the verses, but Acts chapter 18, verse 5. Look at this. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit, small s. His spirit was stirred, and he was pressed in the spirit, and that impressed the Holy Spirit to flow through his spirit to get something done for God. Now, what's your spirit like? Look, I don't care how bad it is. Put a smile on your face. 
<laughs> yeah. don't, don't be a bad testimony. You're the only Bible some people ever know. They'll never read the Bible, but they'll read your face. And by the way, the great thing, do you know the devil can't read your mind? Only God can read your mind. Only the Holy Spirit can read your mind. The devil can't read your mind. But when you, you frown at the face, you know, and you have problems, the devil reads your face. Oh, oh financial problems cause him to backslide. Oh, oh, I know how to hit him now. You understand what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit reads your actions and reactions. That's why if you're saved, tell your face. Put a smile on your face. You're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. And rejoice about it. And let everybody know this is wonderful. You don't go to a football game with your favorite team and sit there and scowl. You, you, you cheer them up. Yeah, run that, tackle that guy, pass that ball. What, what's the matter with you, dummy? Do you play for the Broncos? Now, look what he said. And, and, and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the what? Talk to me. In the what? In the what? Not Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's born in your spirit. That's what he's saying. Watch what happens. And testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now, what's the significance of that? I'll tell you what it is. The Apostle Paul was a part of that Sanhedrin court. It was that little semicircle. The Roman government gave them power for capital punishment on those who messed with their religion. And Jesus came along, and he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. And so the Jews said, anybody that preaches about Jesus, we're going we're gonna to kill him. Don't you remember? Uh, Stephen, the deacon that was stoned. Don't you remember how that Paul got warrants? Paul was a zealot. Paul said, I'm not going to wait till we stumble on some Christian. I will, I'll, give me warrants. I'll chase them down. And he was on the road uh, uh, to, get, to get that done when he ran into to, to Stephen. And they killed Stephen. They stoned him. Now, what's he saying? The apostle Paul knew this. So he said, when I start preaching, I get so excited. I don't care. I'm going to tell you that Jesus is the Christ, knowing that my life is in jeopardy. I could be killed for this, but I really don't care. You ought to get some of our sermon tapes, and at the beginning, we start out real slow, and in the middle, we start screaming and hollering, foaming at the mouth. We get our courage up, and we really don't care what you think. But uh, take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Acts chapter 19 and verse 21. Acts chapter 19 and verse 21. In Acts 19, verse 21, the Scripture says, After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit. Now, do you see what's happening here? Your spirit, if you'll stir your spirit, if you'll get excited about the things of God and release the Holy Spirit, He'll overwhelm your soul, and you'll be able to talk confidently about the Lord and about salvation, because it won't be you, it'll be the Holy Spirit. And then, after a while, you'll find, your, you'll find yourself physically being charged and to do the things of God under the energy of the Holy Spirit. i got to tell you, I was tired this morning. I've got to tell you that when I got up to teach and preach this morning, I was worn out. I'm an old man. i got one foot in the grave, another on a banana peel. I'm in the early 70s. Uh, <laughs> I joke, and I was having three years of overtime. Uh, 70, you know, you promised that. But anyway, uh, I can't even afford to buy a car on time. I haven't got time. But uh, I, I'm just saying to you, please, I, you, the only reason I could do what I did last week, I got in bed at 5 o'clock in the morning, and two hours later, I got up at 7 and went and preached all day long and taught all day long. And then I got to bed, and then, then Monday, I taught all day long and, and, and preached that night. And, and I, but I did it. And, I, and why? It's the energy of the Holy Spirit. That's why. I'm an introvert. You don't believe it, but I am. I, I got an accounting degree from uh, Michigan State University because I didn't like people. An accountant, if you know anything about them, they want to be, you put me in a corner, give me an adding machine and a pen and a ledger, and I'll be happy. Just I don't want to mess with anybody. Just leave me alone. But boy, all of a sudden, something happened when I gave my life at a sword conference in 1972 to the Holy Spirit of God. And I, I, John Rice and Jack Hiles preached, and I was motivated and stirred. And I said, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And I dove in the altar, and I said, dear God, do what you've got to do with me. I want to serve you. Give me your power. And God has blessed all these years wonderfully. You don't understand it. But for five years in a row, we baptized 10,000 every year for five years. We had the number two church in the world as far as soul winning is concerned. But God did that. It wasn't me. 
We baptized 4,464 people the last year that I pastored. 153 of those were mine. Where did the other 4,300 come from? They weren't mine. They were the dear people sitting in the pews. I'd, I've laughed so often. Some of our guys would work midnights, work uh, shift. And uh, I, I looked up one day and I saw one of my men come in with a convert and sat in the back pew. And he'd worked all night long, bless his heart. But he went by and picked up his convert. And he fell asleep while I was preaching. And uh, he got a good rest. And, uh, uh, but when, when it came time for the invitation, he, he shook himself like this and stood up and said, uh, can I pray with you? And he walked down the aisle with his convert by his side. I have laughed about that a thousand times over. Thank God that he was tired. But he, he uh, under the energy of the Holy Spirit, he went that morning and picked up his convert and brought him to church. Now, you, you, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it through the Holy Spirit of God. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, that means that the Holy Spirit of God, it, you've got dynamite. You've got dynamo. You've got God, the Holy Spirit, living in you. The one that created the worlds, that created your body. Do you know how you're wonderfully made? You, you're not going to go home tonight and lick two fingers and put it in the socket to recharge yourself so you can make it tomorrow. You don't have to. Everything you need is right there in your body. And God has blessed you. Now he's also given you the Holy Spirit of God born in your spirit. Now let it release the Holy Spirit. Release him. How do you do it? Two things. You confess as sin that burr under your saddle. Confess it as sin. Burr. Upset. With somebody. You don't, don't, don't do what a lady did in Oklahoma. She walked up to another lady after I preached this sermon and said, I've hated your guts for years. And I want to make it right. <laughs> Look, if you don't like me, don't tell me. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Nobody else wants to hear it either. <laughs> but you come down here to the altar and say, Dear God, please forgive me. I've had ought to get somebody, and I want to make it right. And then if there's anything in your life where you're upset with God about, I mean upset with him. You say to yourself, that's not fair. Who said life was fair? Who in the world told you that? You bought a wooden nickel when you got that one. My son Scott came to me, and he said, Daddy, the principal doesn't like me. Daddy, what are you going to do about it? I said, son, I pay the principal not to like you. <laughs> I want you to learn your math, your geography, and your science. I don't want you to be an apple polisher and get by just because you're the preacher's son. I don't want that at all. I want you to get an education. And, uh, and he's going to make sure you get an education. He said, no, I don't think it's fair. I said, who told you life was fair? Life is not fair. I, I got pulled over one time and got a ticket for speeding, and I was not speeding. The speedometer was wrong. <laughs> you better watch you better learn to laugh at yourself, and you better learn to laugh at the things of life. Keep a good spirit. Keep a good spirit. And, boy, will you see the results from it. And it won't be you, and it won't be your personality. It will be the Holy Spirit of God flowing through you. Let's stand. Our heads are bowed, and our eyes are closed.